Hello, and welcome to the Language School the World, where learning authentic English is fun and easy. Are you ready to level up your English? English grammar can feel overwhelming at times with what seems like a mountain of rules to memorize, subject verb agreement, Oxford commas, active versus passive voice. It's really easy to get lost in it all. But here's good news. Uh, there aren't actually that many rules that you need to know if you focus on mastering just a handful of key rules, you'll easily avoid common mistakes and start sounding like a true English pro. In this video, we're going to learn about the 11 most essential grammar rules that you should always keep in mind to speak and write more confidently. Whether you're learning for school or work or simply for fun, these rules um, will help you make everything clearer and easier for you. Before we start, we kindly ask you, however, to click on the subscribe button so you never miss out on all our free content and our channel can continue growing. Your support means the world to us. Thank you. So here we go and dive right in and let's look at rule number one, which is super easy and it is write in complete sentences. So every sentence actually needs two things in English, a subject, so the person or the thing that is doing the action, and a verb or also as we call it the action word. Without these, it's just not a sentence, it's called a fragment. And here an, is an easy way to remember. A complete sentence tells you who is doing something and what they are doing. So let me give you a couple of examples so that I can make uh, this concept easier. So a correct sentence would be, my friend plays football. An incorrect sentence would be, plays football. Now, we don't know who is playing football in the sentence. In some languages, Actually, it's not necessary to include a subject in a sentence because often the verb itself can indicate who or what you're talking about. However, this does not work in English. And even if it feels repetitive or unnecessary, you always need to include a subject. For example, in English, we say it is raining. You cannot say just simply is raining. So even though it may seem obvious who or what you're referring to, you still need to include the subject to make your sentence complete. And so even if it feels redundant, remember to always include the subject in English sentences. It helps your sentence sound clear and is grammatically correct. Let's move on to rule number two. Make sure your subjects and verbs agree. You may not expect to find this agreement in a sentence about puppies, but the sentence, my puppies wants food, is definitely having an argument with itself. So the subject, puppies, is plural, but the verb wants is singular. So for verb uh, subject agreement, you have to match singular subjects to singular verbs and plural subjects to plural verbs. So this, of course, um, is a problem mainly in the present simple because you need to remember that the S uh, at the end of the verb goes on the third person singular. It doesn't happen that much on all the other tenses. So for example, in the sentence, my puppies wants food, you have a plural subject puppies, and a singular verb wants food. Uh, so the correct sentence, of course, is my puppies want food. You have a plural subject and a plural verb. Okay, now let's move on to uh, rule number three. Link ideas uh, with a conjunction or a semicolon. 
So although writing uh, in simple sentences is grammatically correct, sometimes it's not really very interesting. So you should combine your simple sentences with coordinating conjunctions for, and, nor, but, or, yet, so to make compound sentences. Let me give you an example. My friend found a cat and she named it Daisy or our team won the championship so we got a trophy. You can also mix it up by using a semicolon instead uh, of a conjunction. This is of course when you are writing. Uh, Delia found a cat, semicolon, she named it Purdy or our team won the championship, semicolon, we got a trophy. Rule number four, use commas correctly. While you can use a comma with a coordinating conjunction, you can't use a comma alone to combine independent clauses. I know this sounds confusing. Let me give you an example. You can use a comma with certain connecting words like and, but, or, but you cannot use um, a comma to just simply join two complete sentences. If you do that, it is a grammar mistake, error, and it's called a comma splice. Uh, and it leads to run-on sentences. So make sure to use a comma along with a connecting word when you want to join two complete ideas. For example, my friend found a cat, comma, she named it Daisy. Now this is incorrect. This is what we call a comma splice because there is no connecting word. The correct uh, version would be, my friend found a cat, comma, and she named it Daisy. Now this is correct. The comma is used with the connecting word and. So this error known as comma, uh, comma splice, it creates run on sentences. So it makes lots of different sentences one after the other and it just does not sound right. So you use a comma only if you're also using a coordinating conjunction. So my friend found a cat, comma, she named it Daisy is incorrect. Our team won the championship, comma, and we got a trophy, this is correct. Now, talking about commas, let's move on to point number five, which is the use of the serial comma when necessary. So when you're listing items in a sentence, you separate them with commas. The last comma in the series is called the Oxford comma. And honestly, not everyone likes it. Let's look at an example. We have some goats, comma, cows, comma, and horses on our farm. Now this, the last comma is called an Oxford comma. You can also have, we have some goats, comma, cows, no comma, and horses in our farm. Now, whether you use an Oxford comma or not is up to you and uh, your, up to your style guide. However, you should always use an Oxford comma when the sentence could be confusing without it. For example, the farmer saw the goats, comma, Jill, comma, and Pierre. Now the, the Oxford comma clarifies that they are goats and that there are two people named Jill and Pierre. Now look at the sentence. The farmer saw the goats, comma, Jill and Pierre. If there is no Oxford comma, so if there is no, no comma before and, um, it makes it sound like the goats are named Jill and Pierre. So be careful with how you use the comma. 
Point number six, use the active voice. So sentences in an active voice put the subject before the verb. For example, in the active sentence, the duck ate the bread, the duck is the subject. It performs the action in the verb, ate, to the object in the sentence, the bread. For example, Shelby dried the dishes, it's active, Shelby is the subject. Mary walked the dog, it's active, Mary is the subject. Passive voice sentences place the subject after the verb or they leave the subject out completely. For example, the bread was eaten by the duck is a passive sentence because the subject, the duck, comes after the verb was eaten. The object of the sentence, the bread, somehow ends up at the beginning of the sentence, which sometimes makes it confusing to read. So, for example, the dishes were dried by Shelby. This is a uh, passive. The subject is after the verb. The same goes for the dog was walked by Mary. It's a passive sentence. Writing or speaking in the passive voice makes sentences confusing and the meaning sometimes is unclear. So if you can choose, try and use active voice all the time and also it's quite easy to turn sentences from the passive into the active voice. Now, talking about verbs and doing actions, let's look at point number seven, use the correct verb tense. Using a, a verb tense that doesn't match your time period is like stepping into a broken time machine. When did the action happen today, tomorrow, or 100 years ago? Is it still happening? Make sure you've got the correct tense for the time period you are describing. So the present tense, something that happens all the time or is happening right now, Mary and I eat lunch every Tuesday. The past tense, something that happened before now, Mary and I ate lunch. The future tense, something that will happen in the future, Mary and I will eat lunch. When talking about a continuous action, you can use the present, the past, or the future progressive or continuous tense. So this means the verbs that end in ing. If you're talking about something that happened across a span of time, you use the perfect uh, verb tenses with the modal verb have or had. Now, we've got plenty of videos on our channel that explain English verb tenses in detail. Feel free to check them out for a quick and helpful reference. Now, uh, not only do you need to choose the right tense, but you have to keep your verb tense consistent. And we come to point number eight. So another part of using the correct verb tense concerns consistency. If you start a sentence or a paragraph or a page, or if you're writing a book in one tense, you need to make sure that the rest of your writing is also in that tense. You can go back and forth uh, if you're talking about different time periods, but be careful not to mix them up. Listen to the sentence. Steward lost his wallet. He goes to the bank and gets some cash. Then he went to the restaurant. Mm. The sentence kind of makes me feel seasick. The tense goes from past to present and then uh, back to the past again. The correct sentence would be, Stuart lost his wallet. He went to the bank and got some cash. Then he went to the restaurant. The tense stays in the past. You can also use the present. For example, uh, Stuart loses his wallet. He goes to the bank um, and gets some cash and then he goes to the, to the restaurant. Now, point number nine, apostrophes should only be used for possession and contractions. It's a common mistake to use apostrophes with plural nouns. Apostrophes have two main jobs, indicating missing letters in a contraction and showing possession in a singular or plural nouns. 
That's it. So, the correct sentence would be Sarah apostrophe S. So, Sarah's going to the park. Uh, Sarah is a contraction of Sarah is. Um, another example of a correct sentence would be Is this Michael's book? Apostrophe S. Now, the apostrophe S in this case, as you might know, shows possession. The teacher's lounge is down the hall. Now, in this case, you will have an apostrophe after teachers, after the S, because it is a plural possessive noun. Incorrect is happy holidays from the Smiths, apostrophe S on the Smiths, because Smiths is just plural, so there is no apostrophe needed. The only rare case where you may use an apostrophe for plurals is with lowercase letters. For example, watch out for the A's in the sentence. Otherwise, leave them out without making nouns plural. Let's move on to point number 10. Keep your homophones straight. So using uh, two when you actually mean two, <laughs> is a common avoidable mistake. Make sure you know the difference between common homophones to keep your meaning clear. For example, two as in the number, two as in a preposition, or two as in also, or your and your, you are, or there, meaning in that place, or there, meaning belonging to them, or they are there, which is all pronounced in the same way, except versus accept, then versus than. These aren't the only commonly confused words in English. Uh, on our channel, you can find some videos on this too. So feel free to check them out for a quick, helpful reference. Let us know in the comments which ones you find most confusing so we can give you some tips on how to remember them. And now let's go on to the last tip, the last point. Remember to use end punctuation correctly. Every sentence has to come to a close and that's where end punctuation comes in. Choosing the right punctuation mark can help set the tone of your sentence, of course, when you're writing. So the full stop or also the period is at the end of the sentence, Sarah walked to the office. This is a neutral or serious tone. Question mark. Put it at the end of, the, of a question. Sarah, uh, Sarah walked to the office. This shows confusion or doubt. And the exclamation point, Sarah walked to the office. This shows excitement or surprise. And don't forget, when you're ending a sentence with a quote or dialogue, the punctuation mark should go inside the quotation marks and not outside. So the correct would be open inverted commas, let's go to the park, comma, uh, close inverted commas, said Tim. Another example uh, can be uh, open inverted commas, Watch out for that car, exclamation mark, close inverted commas, he shouted, full stop. Just remember, the punctuation you choose can change the whole feel of your sentence. So choose correctly. Remember, mastering a language is all about practice and perseverance. So keep watching, keep practicing, and don't be afraid to make mistakes. That's how we grow as learners. And remember, as we say in English, practice makes perfect. If you like this video, please hit the like button and we hope to see you soon. Thanks for watching.